Yo, it's Austin, and before we get started today, I want to talk to y'all about today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. Some of y'all might be familiar with them as they've sponsored the channel before, but in case you aren't, ExpressVPN is a VPN provider that works to encrypt your internet connection, hide your IP, and protect your private information from others. I use this for a multitude of reasons on the reg, but one of the main ones is in case I want to log into a public Wi-Fi. Since ExpressVPN works on mobile, I don't feel worried about logging into an unencrypted internet connection while I'm at home. It's also pretty useful for something like Netflix. A lot of content is region locked even though I'm paying for it. Let's say I'm feeling like crying, I want to watch your name, but I can't because it's not in the States, but it's available in the UK. A couple clicks with ExpressVPN, connect myself to a server in the UK, and I can start having intense feelings right away. <laughs> I'm not sad. You are. ExpressVPN is nice because it doesn't store your data, it has really fast speeds compared to the competitors, and it's really easy to use. I think use it myself. So if you're looking for a good way to protect all your personal data and want to get yourself three months free with a subscription, click the link down in the description below to learn more. That's expressvpn.com forward slash eruption to get started today. Thanks again to ExpressVPN for supporting the channel. Now on with the show. Licensed anime video games. There sure are a lot of them. While these are a dime a dozen, in the western market you won't see nearly as many. It makes sense for us to get multiple video games based on Superman, one of if not the most recognized American fictional character of all time. But what about the Serial Experiments Lane PlayStation 1 game? Why didn't we get this? Y you know what. But even for all of the licensed anime games that did make it stateside, there are so many that have virtually gone under the radar, some of which I rarely see anyone talk about. It takes being a Dragon Ball Z Budokai 1 and 3 to get yourself ported onto another console to remain even slightly relevant, so a lot of these are just gathering dust. And today, we're gonna brush a few of them off. We're going to be sticking to titles that were released in the States, so sorry to anyone who was hoping I would talk about that JoJo's Bizarre Adventure game. But hey, one day. So yo, it's Austin, and I'm finally set in my new place. You could put chess on that. Poorly. Let's talk about some of those forgotten licensed anime video games, starting with probably one of the oldest, Ranma 1 Half Hard Battle. How Ranma 1 Half got 14 different video games over 5 years is beyond me, but how America got any of them is even weirder. Rumiko Takahashi is one of those manga artists who's had not just one, not two, but five completely different series reach millions of sales over six decades. One of those we'll talk about in a sec, but for now, Ranma. Ranma 1 Half was one of the first anime series Viz decided to license in the States. So in 1993, a year after the series finished in Japan, VHS tapes began to flood Sun Coasts. Western audiences began to be like, why is Ranma so hot both ways? And simultaneously, Ranma 1 Half Hard Battle was released on the Super Nintendo. This wasn't actually the first game that made its way over here from the Ranma series, though. There was another called Shounai Gekitoen that went through a full on old school American conversion and became Street Combat. Let's get it on. But Ranma 1 Half Hard Battle did make it over here, and the word hard sure is apt. I don't consider myself a pro by any means when it comes to fighting games, but I did 3 0 Wooly and Ultimate. Max, so that, that's that gotta mean something. My Naoto? Undefeated. This was made pretty early on in the console fighting game craze, but not early enough to know that a jump button was a bad idea and a block button. You've also got really complicated combo attacks like, like press forward and special attack or like down and special attack. It's very deep. It's not a very good fighting game, but hard battle coming out at all feels like a miracle. And it was one of those games that ancient otaku were excited to see. Fans of the series were pleased, but nowadays why you would play this over any fighting game is beyond me. Not when Sailor Moon S exists. Okay, so Toonami, right? In the States, Toonami was the quintessential distributor of Japanese animation on television. Other channels might have done it, but none more frequently and efficiently than Toonami. A lot of people might recall the station simply for how much Dragon Ball Z it aired, but I'll always remember saying things like Outlaw Star, IGPX, or most relevant to this video, Zoids. Zoids were one of those multimedia franchises that existed seemingly with one and only one mission, making money. These are another one of those Takara Tommy created joints, sharing the stage with the likes of Transformers, Lika Chan, and for those unfamiliar with my previous Forgotten PS2 games video, Psy Girls. Except unlike Psy Girls, this one actually 
has made money over nearly 40 years too. You might call Zoids a success. Your parents might have actually had one of those 1980s Zoids back in the day, but I was introduced to them with a little anime airing on Toonami called Zoids New Century, also known as Tournament Arc the Anime. This was a show about a little team of Zoid pilots and a scavenger with a heart of gold named BitCloud making deep connections with the Liger Zero. It was extremely extra and I loved it so much and I totally didn't just trace a panel from the manga and tell everyone that I did it. Wow, we could talk about this anime and the prequel that came out afterwards here, Chaotic Century, for an entire video, I need to talk to y'all about some of the games that came out around the same time as them. First up, Zoids Battle Legends for the GameCube, also known as Zoids vs. 3 in Japan. It's even got my boy Bit on the cover. I mean, look, if you put a bunch of giant mecha robot animals into a big arena with guns and swords strapped to their backs, you're bound to have a good time, right? Well, <laughs> it's okay. You've got a decent amount of customization, you've got a bunch of characters from the show, but the gameplay's just kinda lacking. Especially if you're putting it up against other similar GameCube anime looking arena fighters with mechs like Gotcha Force or Custom Robo. You basically just run around with your Zoid, find other Zoids, and try to beat them up. You have a really limited move set that consists of ranged and melee attacks. You can jet boost around, which, while cool, isn't as cool as the anime makes it seem. It doesn't help that the melee is a solid two-hit combo that looks the same every time. You unlock parts for your different Zoids in the garage, but it's not, it's not a crazy amount. It's kind of underwhelming. But also, as a kid, I thought this game was so good. Despite how janky it is nowadays, if there was a Liger Zero in there, I was in. Nowadays, it's like a solid 5 out of 10. So it's okay, but what about a Zoids game on a brand new console? None of this GameCube nonsense. I'm talking 16 by nine. We're taking this to the Xbox 360, which is now actually 15 years old, but <laughs> Zoids Assault. It is very rare that I'll fall asleep while playing a video game. Usually a mishmash of colors on a bright TV will keep anyone awake with few exceptions. You gotta be like a boring visual novel, Metal Gear Survivor, Ace. Or in today's case, Zoid's Assault. On that day, snow fell in the dried out lands of Jamil for the first time in 50 years. This here's Zoid's Assault, a strategy RPG published by Atlas and developed by the dudes who made Cooking Mama. No, not the one that'll hack your mom's smart fridge. Three and four. Zoid's Assault has a more realistic, grim Tark take on Zoid's, the colorful, very anime mecha robot fighting show. Now, normally I'm all for taking the absurd shonen out of the robot and making it heavy hitting. Gundam 08 MS Team is one of the best mecha anime for that exact reason, but like, maybe Zoid's didn't need that? I'm not sure why they thought making everything brown and gray was the correct way to present a grimdark story, but I guess this was a 360 game in 2008, so that's like the primetime dirt and bloom era. But this would be okay if the story was interesting and told well. If. Instead, we've got pans of a single anime girl talking to a bunch of old dudes, walls of text, the same image of the woman talking to the old men again. It's, it's just extremely bland. This is a shame because some of the combat systems are pretty neat. You get a small amount of customization on each of your Zoids and there's a cool support system where if you're attacking dudes next to allies, they'll also engage in the attack, turning what was one shot into three or five. This is of course supplemented by the highest quality animations or the screen shaking violently and the the model not moving at all, Zoids Assault was a huge disappointment for me back in the day. When you combine the words Zoids, Atlas, Strategy RPG, and Anime Girl, normally I'd be all over that. But in the case of this one, we're given a game that was not only forgettable at the time, but doubly so 12 years later. All right, let's talk about something good. I talked about something from this franchise in my Bad Anime Games Volume 2 video, but now it's a good game. But now it's time to talk about Astro Boy Omega Factor. Let's rock it! Astro Boy from the PlayStation 2 continues to haunt me from the grave. Osamu Tezuka's classic manga and anime is a staple of the medium, but that game was a time. What happens when you take the development out of Sonic Team's hand and put it in treasures? Yeah, Gunstar Heroes, Mischief Makers, Guardian Heroes, McDonald's Treasure Land Adventures treasure. Well, apparently you get Nintendo Power's 38th best game of all time. Astro Boy Omega Factor is one heck of a video game that's never gotten a port, never gotten a remaster, and hardly gets mentioned. The 
North American version of this game was not only extremely good, but holds its own today. I say North American because it was actually delayed here to release at the same time as the 2004 anime and PS2 game, and they fixed a couple of the issues. Why they would release so much Astro Boy in one day is beyond me, but at least this one's the good one. Unrelated to the 2003 anime, Omega Factor is just a solid run and gun. While I wouldn't say it ranks up there with the likes of Gunstar Heroes, it does a lot of neat stuff, especially for a licensed game. The controls are simple enough, you've got punches, kicks, finger lasers, machine guns. You can dash in certain directions, some levels become shmuppy. It's got that classic Sega treasure variety. Every level has hidden characters from the manga and other Tezuka works, and they give you items to buff yourself. Kimba the White Lion, sure, he's here. Why not? Bosses range from a fair challenge to this is definitely a treasure video game difficulty. If you played any of their other games, you know what to expect. Sometimes you just want an old school, straightforward, good and simple time, and Astro Boy Omega Force will definitely do that. It's absolutely worth your while if you can find a copy of it, but also, hey, Sega, you gotta like, start porting different things. Don't let something like this disappear with time. You don't have to keep porting Altered Beast. You really don't. Rise from your grave. No, not again. Sometimes in life, you want to be proactive. You want to do stuff with your hands, like hold a pencil and like write a word or something. Other times, you just want to press a button and then fall asleep. And for you, we have the critically praised Beyblade video games. Ah yes, Beyblade. When the average Metacritic score of your entire franchise is sitting at a 43, you know you're doing something right. This is, of course, without the emotionally gripping PlayStation 1 debut, Beyblade, let it rip. What a great dog. Wow. Oh, like the concept of Beyblade is one that predates, well, pretty much most of the Earth's population. People have been carving these toy spinny tops and making them fight for centuries. These things have been found in archeological sites. Dinosaurs were probably playing with them, but leave it to once again, our boys at Takara Tami to release a brand new colorful anime infused version of the spinning top. Call it a Beyblade and rise to the top of early 2000s consumerism. Let it rip, they say, as parents pull out their wallets to purchase illegal Beyblade combinations for their kids to participate in the underground battle rings. I can understand the novelty in like having a physical toy in your hand, doing the pulley spinny thing, screaming, let it rip, and waiting with bated breath. There's appeal in that. Now, I fell asleep watching the 2012 Beyblade World Championship stream in Toronto. It's practically ASMR. But a video game? Wow! Feel the shock of the collision! Yeah, no. A few years ago, a dear friend of mine decided to send me his copy of Beyblade V-Force Super Tournament Battle, and uh, I really wish he didn't. I don't really know much about the stories or characters in these shows, but I do know that that is a gun. These are just guns. You shoot battling spinning tops with a special triggerable power out of a gun. This is peak 2000s energy here. Except in the video game, you just hit A at the right time and then press it again to make the top do a special cinematic bit that nine out of 10 times does nothing of substance. Most of the time, you just gotta watch it spin, maybe move it a tiny bit. <laughs> <laughs> this game is weird. All of the menus are nicely made and cool to look at. All of the actions are colorful and flashy. The music ain't half bad. There's a whole Beyblade upgrade and shop system. I'm sure there's something here, but I could be playing literally any other video game. In fact, we could play any of the other Beyblade video games, but let's not. Also, the Beyblade OC you make at the beginning looks straight out of South Park. And all you Beyblade V-Force defenders out there, all, all three of you, don't yell at me. We have covered a ton of Dragon Ball Z video games on this channel, and mostly bad ones. In fact, it wouldn't be an anime games video of mine without me at least mentioning the franchise, so let's try it again, but a little different this time. Dragon Ball, hold the Z, Revenge of King Piccolo. It's pretty amazing that Dragon Ball Z, GT, and Super have been so wildly popular over the last 35 years. It's not often you'll have toys, games, movies, and shows from that many decades, but if anyone could pull that off, it was Goku. With a little assist from Akira Toriyama, I guess. But around the series 25th anniversary, we would get a little beat em up for the Wii that I think went completely under everyone's radar despite it being a totally serviceable game. Even weirder, it was made by MediaVision, the developers behind one of 
my favorite JRPG franchises, Wild Arms. And while I would never say that King Piccolo is up there with Wild Arms 3, this little Dragon Ball game wasn't half bad. So rather than starting from the very beginning of the saga like countless other video games do, this one starts right after the first tournament arc with the Red Ribbon Army, which was one of my favorites. And as a beat em up, not surprisingly, this works pretty well. Dragon Ball Revenge of King Piccolo was pretty similar to the Game Boy Advance game I covered a while back, Advanced Adventure. They both go through the Dragon Ball story, they both are beat em ups, and they're both totally underrated by today's standards. The main difference here is that when you get to boss fights, Revenge of King Piccolo turns into more of a 3D arena fighting game. However, the combo system isn't the most well made for that. You get a little 1-2-3 punch, which can turn into an AoE attack or an air launcher. Sometimes you can lock onto dudes and kick at them. There's a Kamehameha meter, which fills up over time, allowing you to do big old key blasts, which will kill everything. Thankfully, there's not a button to make Goku check out people's privates. <laughs> but we do get really lovely looking in-game cutscenes. It's cute. Look how cute it is. Everything is pretty straightforward, but the gameplay does seem like it's going to be diving into Metroidvania from time to time, but in the end, every level is just a point A to point B affair, with little to no deviation in design. The game's pretty short, and there's only a few points where you try something new, like tickling Corrin, and to be honest, there are better Dragon Ball games out there, like, like Advanced Adventure. But there's something about King Piccolo that's charming to me. Maybe it's how cute everything is in the cutscenes. Maybe it's the simplicity of the game, reminding me of some of my favorites like Streets of Rage 2. Maybe I'm just a sucker for Dragon Ball. But alongside Dragon Ball Advanced Adventure, Revenge of King Piccolo was one of those licensed anime games that gave me hope that people could make fun things that weren't 1v1 fighting games, even if that's pretty much all we get these days. It was a mash of a bunch of different genres of games into one, and while none of them were groundbreaking, none of them were bad either. So hey, good job on that. Not surprisingly, MediaVision would go back to JRPGs where they've been making the Digimon and Valkyria Chronicles games, but at least we know their attempt at a licensed beat-em-up was decent. But they should really go back to Wild Arms. Please. So clearly there's a ton of licensed anime games, especially during the PlayStation 1 and 2 era. There's the survival horror inspired Vampire Hunter D on the PlayStation 1, which isn't very good. There's the loop on the third stealth action game. There's not one, but two Erica 7 PlayStation 2 games that made it over here and like a trillion Gundam and Naruto games that time has left behind. And these are just ones that were localized. Now I'll get to a lot of, if not all of these one day, but for now we need to talk about one more anime. I mentioned earlier that we weren't done with Rumiko Takahashi because we need to talk about Inuyasha. I want to change the world. If you haven't been in a hotel room with 10 people singing this at like 3 a.m., you probably haven't lived yet. For a time there in the 2000s, Inuyasha felt like it was the premiere anime. You couldn't go two steps at an anime convention without seeing one of the characters, some merch, or a big ol' sword. Pretty much every cosplayer I know had a pocket kagome. It was the perfect blend of shonen and shoujo that ultimately was a massive hit worldwide with an appeal that kept the manga going for 12 years, 193 episodes across two anime series, multiple movies, live action adaptations, stage plays, and more recently, a new spin-off. Even though for a majority of the series, Inuyasha relied on the monster of the week trope, it was still popular enough to get all of this, and of course, the pinnacle, video game adaptations. Now, surprisingly, the Western market actually got a majority of the releases. Like, obviously we didn't get the Patchy Slot or Wonder Swan Color games, but with the exception of two more obscure titles, Inuyasha came out full force in the States. But of the four releases we got, I want to focus today on one. Sure, the PlayStation 1 fighting game's a trip. It was one of the last things released on that console, and it's not even that great, but there's nothing quite like unleashing Kagome's Atare over and over to annoy whoever you're playing with. Also, Moroku needs to be in jail. Put this man away. So this one's pretty absurd, but the one I want to talk about the most today is probably the weirdest, Inuyasha Secret of the Cursed Mask. Inuyasha Dating Simulator RPG. Three words that when strung together might be a curse. Now, Inuyasha has its canonical romantic pairings and everything, but a majority of the time was spent doing a will they, won't they thing between Inu and Kagome. But thanks to this video game, now they gotta worry about a new romantic rival, Kururugi Austin. This man is mine, 
even if he likes to push me into wells. Just like Inuyasha itself, Secret of the Cursed Mask is an isekai. You can pick a male or female character and then you mysteriously end up in this new world where you'll meet the entire cast of Inuyasha and what happens from there is, well, a series of additional Monster of the Week episodes back to back. It's like a filler arc where another person from Kagome's time ended up in feudal Japan and that's, that's basically the entire story. Cursed Mask is a JRPG, but it's not a very good one. Part of that is due to the fact that if you want to do any Anything, it takes 400 years. And not like a quick time warp, but waiting in line at the DMV. After the beginning sequence, you have to walk around the starting town to figure out where to go, but the game doesn't tell you who or what to talk to, so you're just running back and forth, making sure to talk to every single person like three times and hope that the game just lets you go. Then when you get out, you're introduced to what might possibly be the slowest combat system in any video game I've ever played. Coming from fast paced RPGs like Persona 5 or even older ones like Final Fantasy 7 at this point, Secret of the Cursed Mask is brutal. A typical battle takes about 30 seconds to zone in, show the enemies, load everything. Then you'll spend weird awkward seconds trying to target stuff while watching your arm hair grow out slowly as it switches between turns to finally win and be led out to the results screen. With a quote from one of your Inuyasha friends, of course. What an easy victory. Then you take like four steps and Another random battle. Sometimes it legit takes like six minutes to get from one screen to another thanks to all these battles and loading screens. All I want is to date Inuyasha, but I can't because anytime I crack my knee, a battle begins. <laughs> Not that it would be very hard to trick him anyways considering me and his girl got the same model. Secret of the Cursed Mask is one of those JRPGs that was definitely intended for beginners. It's not very difficult. The combat system is basic enough to understand. The only things you really have to work towards getting are the co-op attacks that you unlock from hanging out with one of your friends after your monster of the week. I asked Inuyasha to smell out some herbs and he couldn't do it. And then I was rewarded with this picture of him walking into a smash tournament. Beautiful. As much as I like Inuyasha, with this fanfic tier writing, it's really hard to want to keep moving forward. With its very slow paced gameplay, lackluster writing, and a generic soundtrack, it's definitely one of those anime games that time's kind of forgotten about. I can see modding this game to move literally three times faster and make Maybe it being a pretty enjoyable time, but that sure isn't what they did. <laughs> Straight up, I lost the patience to go all the way with Inuyasha, so Kururugi Austin will have to wait another day. Or, or never. Sorry, babe. Secret of the Cursed Mask was one of the last games made by Quintet, the people responsible for Act Razor, Illusion of Gaia, and Terra Nigma. How they couldn't make a fun JRPG with that catalog is beyond me, but at least it's inoffensive. I mean, it's, it's just a licensed game. It's not like, uh, you know, Star Ocean 3. If there's one thing to take from today, just remember, in Japanese, Hakama means old-fashioned pants. This reminds me of something. Well, if there is one thing that both Inuyasha and Zoids now have in common, it's that their video games both put me to sleep. So, um, so good job. Well, that's all for today, but make sure to join me next time when I talk about my college thesis about Garfield. Thank you all so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Brandon Howell, Chris Shelton, Christopher Olivia, Cliff Pro, Donald Dowdy, David Molnar, Eli Shane Stoffenecker, Flaming Fighter, Imee, Jay Roos, Jeffrey Narvaez, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Jordy McCaffrey, Josh Garbage Lord, Kevin Zanowski, Kieran Arter, Legend Gary, Nitron, and Plasma Phoenix. Thank you all so much for watching. If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can do so on Patreon.com or just by subscribing and watching the videos. If you do sign up for the Patreon, make sure to join the Discord where we uh, do the worst things. But in any case, we'll have another video out here pretty soon. I know it's been a minute. Uh, had to readjust, had to rebuild the set, but things are looking good now. I'll catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.